My name is Donald Ogden. I was a tech sergeant in the U.S. Army Air Corps. I flew combat based in Italy. I enlisted. I tried to enlist the day after Pearl Harbor, but I was too young. I worked on a farm because I was still going to school, but I milked in the morning and milked in the afternoon, and weekends I worked in the fields or whatever. I wanted to be a pilot, and I tried to join this uh, aviation cadet, and I had to be 18 to do that. And then I didn't have any college, so I had to take a test, and I flunked math, so I went back to school, <laughs> took a refresher course, and I passed math, and uh, then I enlisted. They tried to talk me into being a glider pilot, but I didn't think very much of that idea. Well, it's a one-way trip. Glider, they pull you over and they let you go, and then you're in the infantry. My stepfather dropped me off down at Newark, New Jersey, and I had quite a while to wait for the train to leave to go to Fort Dix, so I bought a, a pound bag of a cashew nuts, I love cashew nuts, and I chewed on those and wandered around town and finally went down by train down to Fort Dix. I'll be very honest, I had no idea how bad it can be, or I'm not so sure I'd have been so. I probably still would, because I, I joined to be in combat. I didn't want to just be based somewhere in the, this country doing whatever. I took infantry basic training down at Fort Dix. And I was the Air Corps, but uh, it wasn't bad because you're not being shot at. And they worked us hard, marched us. I had trouble with the marching. My legs were not adapted to all that marching. You know, once in a while, I'd have to sit down and they'd go on without me. But eventually, I got conditioned, I guess you might say. They come out and they say, Anybody here drive a truck? And they say, yeah, and they give them a shovel and they'd be digging. <laughs> Other than that, we lived in tents and uh, it wasn't bad. They, they knew I was supposed to wind up in Kelly Field in Texas, but they weren't ready for us down there. So they sent us over to Long Island to where they build the Republic P-47. And we were guards there. We had some exciting times there. I shot and killed a dog one night thinking it was a German coming off a submarine or something. Another night I shot and killed one of the trucks. The officer of the guard was driving and he was kind of an idiot anyway to be honest with you. And he's coming over the hill and I had a gate post and I heard him coming and I knew who it was. They had advised me who it was by phone because we have phone at the gate. And when he came down towards me, I got out and yelled halt. And he, he, he sounded like he had it in first gear, not like he didn't know what he was doing. So I stood out and flashed a flashlight in his face, which he shouldn't do, but I did, just to make sure he knew I was there. And then when he didn't stop, I pulled my 45 out and shot right down th through the hood of the, of the truck, and that stopped him. <laughs> And when he jumped out of the truck screaming at me, I stuck the gun right under his nose. And it was still smoke coming out of the barrel. And that was the end of him being very bossy about what was going. He claimed it was my fault, but the three guards from the three posts away from me all heard me halt him more than, more than three times, which is what you're supposed to do the most with. When you're out in there and darkening in, in the middle of the night and they pump you full of ideas about submarines dropping German spies off and they might be coming there to damage the factory or something. So yeah, you get hyper. When I got washed out of the aviation cadet program because I stuttered, uh, they sent me to a, a little town called Honda. Nothing but dirt roads and about four roads is all they had, but we had an air base there. And they made me crew chief on this twin-engine bomber, which was being used as an as a navigation trainer, and they gave me a crew of 20. I had 21 or 27, I'm not, I don't know how many mechanics to lead, and none of them knew what they were doing. 
So I was glad half of them were usually on KP anyway. And uh, they were always getting me in trouble because they do things that they didn't know what they were doing, but they wouldn't ask. So I was kind of glad to get away from that. And the way I got away with it was they had a, uh, a sheet up on the board, board looking for aerial gunners. And I thought to myself, well, that'll get me into a combat group. So I volunteered for that. I got in trouble with a, what we call 90 Day Wonder, who, which is a lieutenant that went through officer's training and had no experience, whatever. And he made us run out. We went to school all night, and he'd come in fresh in the morning, and we're all tired, wanting to go to bed. And he'd run us all the way out to this sand pit to do our exercises. And I, I got in trouble with him because when he said one day on the double arch, I said, blow it out, you know what, arch. And the first time I got away with it, but the second day I got too brave and he caught me. So they, they didn't court martial me, but they, they put me on hard duty for one day and I didn't do anything but go and have ice cream and orange, orange soda most of the day. Keesler was part of my training to, to be a flight engineer. But the stupid thing is they only had one B-24 on the whole field. Mostly we had airplanes from World War I, and that's the honest truth. They had one B-24 and they'd take us out and let us sit in the co-pilot seat and, and run the engines, but the instructor would put his hands on your hands and he'd push your hand, so you really weren't learning anything. But that's where I got in trouble about the Magneto because I, before the war I had the school I went to to be mechanic had a contract with the Army and I overhauled seven Magnetos of the exact same type. And they, they sat us down and gave us all a magneto and said, now just take the cover off the back. Don't do anything more because you, you'll ruin it. Well, <laughs> I couldn't resist. I took the whole thing right down to the bare bones and had it all laid out on the workbench. And this instructor comes along, and I won't tell you what he said. It was not very nice language. It was J.C. Ogden. What the hell have you done? And he ran and got a major, and they come in in a row chewing at me and yelling at me. And I said, sir, just give me five minutes and I'll have this magneto back to work. So they stood and watched me, and it didn't take me even five minutes. I had it on a test stand, it worked fine. Then they wanted me to stay and teach, and I said, no, thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to stay there. First time I got airsick, because we flew in these AT-6 trainers, and you sat backwards holding it on to a 30 caliber machine gun. And if you let go, it whips around and whack you right in the head. So you had to hang on to it. And you had a belt that you fastened that went down to the floor so that when you stood up, you wouldn't fall out of the airplane. Well, the pilots thought that was the greatest thing. Then we would fly alongside of a, of a tow plane and shoot at the target that they're towing. That's that's. And when they're done, some of the pilots would roll the airplane right over. And if your belt was loose, you were out of the airplane, hanging on this belt. So most of us knew, but once in a while you'd see a guy hanging over the side, upside down. <laughs> and the pilot would have to roll it back again so he, so he could get in, get in the airplane. We didn't like those pilots very much. After I went through the gunnery training, then I was sent up to, uh, up to Boise, Idaho where I joined the crew. And we were, we were the crew that stayed together through until they were killed and I managed to get out of the airplane. And uh, the problems I had there was I, I got air sick one time when we had what we call a, a CFI on board. He's a chief pilot, so to speak, and he's testing the pilots. And I got air sick and he all over the Bombay doors. <laughs> And I went up to, to the flight deck and I said, sir, to the CFI, I said, when you land the next time, please let me off because I'm sick. And I got a big lecture about, you should have told me your, your, your health is far more important than the war effort. And I thought, what a bunch of bull that is. <laughs> the first thing they told us at Boise was, you men are expendable. So that, that doesn't back up what he said. But my pilot and I had quite a few talks because that day they made quite a few touch and go landings 
and, uh, and what I had heaved went all over the side of the airplane and dried. And when he was, when they were done flying, he was standing there filling out the log books and all. And here comes the crew chief and says, uh, look at my airplane, sir. It's a mess. Who's going to clean it? And Paul looked around. Paul was our pilot. And he says, I don't know. There's no one here now. He says, so the crew chief says, you're here, sir. You just wait right here while I get a, a bucket and a mop and you're going to clean my airplane. I'm not going to clean it. So that night, Paul and I had a big talk about me quitting and that I should not be flying. And I said, if I don't fly with you, I'll fly with somebody else, but I'm going to fly. I joined up. I want to fight and I'm going to fight. And uh, we finally agreed that I couldn't ride the top turret, which was on the flight deck, because they didn't want me heaving all over the flight deck where the crew is. So uh, I said, I'll fly the nose turret. If I'm sick in the air, nobody's even going to know it. And that's what I did. I flew in the nose turret. And that little fact saved my life, because everybody in the flight deck was killed when we were shot down. And had I been there, I wouldn't be here now. My pilot was not an anxious man. He was 28 years old, older than most of them. He probably had more sense than we did, but he, whenever he could claim he was sick or something and not fly, because we all had to fly so many hours, three phases, and we never f finished one phase. And they finally called us, our crew, and there was three other crews that their pilots were doing the same thing. And the CEO of the base came out to us on, had us out in the field, and he said, you men are all going to wind up flying dead bodies back from overseas. You're not worth the time we're spending to, to train you, but you're just, not, you're just not doing it. So finally they shipped us out. We flew down to El Paso, where there was a base there, and they said, you will fly every day. Well, on the way down, we need to stop for fuel. <laughs> we landed at, at an hour at an Army airfield, and uh, man, they didn't want us there. They tried to get us off, and we couldn't take off without getting fuel, so they finally fueled us, and they rushed us out of there in a hurry, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. Later on, after the war, I learned we landed at the field where they were working on the atomic bomb. And they, <laughs> they didn't want anybody seeing that. But when we got down to, I think it was called Biggs Field, I'm not quite sure. We were at an Army fort. They didn't like the Air Corps. And when we went to town, once I got to town while we were there, soldiers at the fort would throw rocks at our bus. They didn't like us because we had more rank than they did and we had less responsibility for our rank we got for every time we went to another course, we got another stripe. I had five, five stripes. We finally passed all three phases because they flew us, they flew us every day. And uh, we picked up our airplane, a brand new machine, and, and they gave us our gear. And they knew where we were going. We had no idea where we were going. They knew where we were going by what they issued us. And then they loaded it full of mail and stuff we were taking with us. They had uh, like containers in the bomb bay so we could carry stuff. And then we flew from there down to Miami. We were, on the way down, we had a very exciting experience. We had to get up to 30,000 feet, and for a B-24, that was a big effort. Just as we're ready to fly into this bank of clouds, here came five PBY planes, head on right at us. And those five, which are not really, they're not fighter planes, they're kind of sluggish, and they peeled off in every direction and went around us. After we got past them, the navigator picked up his parachute and put it on. I said, it's too late now. <laughs> that scared the living daylights out of him. And I was sitting in the nose turret, so it was even more scary for me because I could see it clearly. But then we got caught in a, a very heavy rain down in, uh, in Miami, like it rains here once in a while, very heavy. And our airplane got soaked and nothing, the radios wouldn't work, we couldn't use any electrical power. We had to open up all the what's called junction boxes where the wires all join each other and dry the whole thing out. So we lost two or three days. So the other planes that were gone were already gone. 
After that, we took off and we landed at Trinidad. And that was in the jungle with a very short runway. And we were heavy because we had all the stuff that we were carrying plus f fuel. And we started our takeoff. The approach to the runway was a big curve. And we started our takeoff at the beginning of the curve. So it meant working the brakes and working the brakes and moving the airplane around and finally hit the runway. And I think we probably took a couple of palm trees with us, I don't know. But we made it. And we flew for hours and hours at seen Every once in a while you'd see a, a clearing and grass huts. So it was all very wild in those days. And finally we crossed over the Amazon, which was 60 miles wide down by where we went over. And we landed at, uh, I'm getting too old, um, had a field down, I think it was Brazil, Fort Alesa, yeah. And we had to do a 50-hour inspection on the airplane. It kept me up all night, me and the other flight engineer. And we completed the inspection. The next day we took off and we crossed the Atlantic. And that was a very effective. I was so tired that I went to sleep laying alongside of the wheel well. There was a little way you can crawl from the bomb bay to get up to the nose where the bombardier and the navigator are supposed to be and be in the nose turret. And I laid in there and, and I fell asleep. And when I woke up, the poor two of them, the navigator and bombardier were jumping around holding their, you know what, trying not to go in their pants because there was no relief tubes in the nose. I don't know why there wasn't, but there wasn't. So of course, and I had to go. So all three of us rushed up to, on the flight deck and we were using the relief tubes and the ball turret gunner was in the turret, and you know all that urine was going in the turret, and he was pretty angry at us. But we, once you started, we couldn't turn it off. But that was, uh, and we landed at the car. Two or three of the airplanes that had gone ahead of us ran out of fuel. Our navigator was good, and my pilot was good. At, handling the engine so we didn't burn a lot of fuel. But when, when, when we landed, I supervised the refueling and both, both wings were almost bone dry. We wouldn't have gone much farther either. They had three trucks, one truck filling two trucks and the two trucks filling the tanks. That was quite a place. They had uh, African guards that wear the little short shirts or skirts and fez on their hat, and their feet are bare. They have leather soles with their feet. I saw one of the guards strike a match on his foot and light a cigarette. While we were there, I had to get get my my 45 out because one of the Arabs, Arabs or whatever they were called, came in and was trying to steal our shoes, and he didn't see me laying down still trying to get enough sleep. But I woke up and I yelled at him, he wouldn't go. I, I pulled the 45 out of my bag and I aimed it at him and he decided he didn't want to stay there anymore. So we went from there up to, uh, I think in Marrakesh. Yeah, Marrakesh. And that was something while we were there. We just made those, stops to fuel up and get some sleep. Flying over the Sahara Desert was amazing. You could see that there had been a war fought there. They were blowing up tanks, trucks, and all sorts of things, it wrecked airplanes over this. And, and the desert runs for miles. It took us two days, one day to fly up north and then another day to fly west, east, I'm sorry, east. But. Uh, that was the first time we ever heard a B-29. We heard this airplane come in at night and we, what the heck is that? And you could hear the power of the engines. They were much larger engines than our B-24s had. And the next morning we got out and there it was. And it, it, it was on its way over to uh, the Asian uh, theater. They didn't use those in Europe. 
And then we flew from there into Tunis, and we learned that the day before we got there, a B-24 had crashed right through the tent city and killed about 100 men on the ground, American pilots and crew. And from there we flew up to Italy, where we were going to be based, but we didn't have enough fuel to make our base, so we landed at a base that was short. And they were in combat, and they came back while we were there, because we didn't, we didn't spend the night there. And that's where I got my first realization that war can be hell. This bunch came back with dropping bombs on a runway that didn't release up in flight, and, and dead people on board the airplanes, planes are full of holes. And I thought to myself, my gosh, this is something really serious. This is war. Germans have bullets. <laughs> and I really didn't give that a thought up until that point. And then the next day we finally got to our base and we joined the 15th Air Force. Turned out that the 15th Air Force was the worst hit Air Force of all the Air Forces in World War II. We had higher losses than all of them. And after a while, when we're flying missions, you begin to realize that you're not going to come. You're not going to come home because every day you see planes going down with 10 men on board. Sometimes they get out, sometimes they don't. Most times they didn't get out because they'd lose a wing or something and then the plane just is totally out of control and, and you can't get out of it. We yeah. took two guys down that I felt so sorry for. They, they relieved the other flight engineer was sick that day, so he wasn't flying with us. And uh, one gunner quit when we got there. He just turned a bowl of jelly, and we knew we couldn't count on him. He was terrified. So we always had to take replacements when, when we flew. One fellow had 48 missions. We had to fly 50 to go home. He had two to go. He was killed. The other fellow had 45 missions to go. I mean, he was already flew 45 missions. Our worst target was Ploesti. They had 1,100 flat guns. We'd be in flak for 45 minutes. It's a long time to be having them shooting at you up there. And you're flying a pretty tight formation, so you know you're losing the airplanes. One thing that always bothered me was that the lead boxes, which would be a box of four, I forget how many planes in a box now, uh, flew high. And the back boxes flew low. So when anybody bailed out up ahead of you, they were in trouble and we could be in trouble. And I saw that happen at Ploesti. I saw these guys, they had an engine fire, and the engine fire gives you about 30 seconds to get out of the airplane, and it blows, blows the wings off or whatever. This poor guy bailed out, and stupidly, I don't know why he did, but he pulled his parachute right in the middle of formation, and he hit the plane right next to me. I could see it so clear that made me ill. He hit the wing just outboard of the outboard engine, cut him right in half, and he was hanging in the parachute with blood and guts hanging out, no legs, no hips, no nothing. And the airplane, minus the wing, went over and went down, and no one could get out of that plane. So ten men died in that airplane. Nobody could get out of it, because we're told to watch when they go down, look for chutes and the chutes never came out because they couldn't get out of the plane. I was so upset because having a nose third, I had a bird's eye view of all this. And I said, I'm never going to fly again. This is my last flight. If I get home, I'm done. Well, of course, the time I got home, well, maybe I'll fly again. <laughs> and that night they came around and said, you, you're going out tomorrow, Ogden. And I said, no, I'm not. I just flat out told them. I didn't make a fuss. Just, I'm not going to fly tomorrow. And I guess they figured out what happened to me, and they they put me on the ground. I thought it was a week, and it was only three days I was back again. But uh, it seemed like more, more, because we were flying seven days a week at times, and combat fatigue was very common with us, and I, I had a case of it myself for a while. But after a while, like I said, when you see this going on day after day, and we never had enough planes, we get re replacements almost every day and we, and, we, and we lose them faster than we were getting them. My crew was mostly killed because they, the plane went into a flat spin 
and the G-forces were so bad they couldn't move from where they were. I was lucky because I had to go down and, 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 and I bailed out right there with the nose wheel doors opened. I wore a heated suit that day, which I don't know why because it wasn't worth a hoot, but it's a weird looking thing. And I wore that a long time after being shot down because it was, looked like blue long johns with zippers down the arms, zippers down the legs, zippers down the front, and then you had a cord that you plugged in at the base of the turret. And that's the one big problem I had getting out of the turret was that cord was wrapped around my foot and I couldn't reach to unplug it. And I didn't have the strength for some reason to pull the plug out with my foot. And uh, I could get this leg up, my left leg out, but my right leg was still stuck in the turret. So I got back in the turret, and I was, the airplane was already in the flat spin, so I was kind of yelling and screaming, I guess. I'm not really sure. But thrashing around, and that apparently pulled the plug. The reason I couldn't bail out or get out of the turret at first was the nose was on fire. They apparently hit an oxygen mine, and I couldn't get out. The bombardier went, which I can't blame him for, for not staying out the fire. But he released the nose gear doors. And there's a lever right where you can pull it down and it opens the doors, but the nose gear stays up so you can bail right out with not having to try to get around the nose, around the nose gear. So after I got out of the turret, I sat down. And I took off my flak suit, but instead of pulling the red thing that one snaps it, I snapped the shoulder and the shoulder and everywhere. And I laid it down, and then I realized the whole back was shot up. And it saved my life. I would have been dead if I hadn't been wearing that flak suit. I put the parachute on. I was still calm through all this. I wasn't calm in the turret, but once I got out of the turret, I was calm. Luckily, my parachute wasn't, wasn't well, it doesn't matter, but... It wasn't burnt because of the fire. I put it on upside down, had to take it off, put it on the right side up. It probably would have worked either way, but then the rip cord would have been over here. And you just train, this is where you reach to pull it automatically. And when I bailed out, I grabbed a hold of the door frame, which I shouldn't have done. The result is I slammed up against the belly of the airplane, which took me right close to the engine on that side and I heard the prop go brrr, right by my ear. It was that close. God was with me all the way. All through World War II he was he's still with me. But uh, then like I said I looked up and there's an airplane right on top of me. We were both going down about the same speed because it never I never fell faster. It, it never went faster thank goodness. Otherwise <laughs> it would have caught me. I'm floating on my back from 20,000 feet or somewhere around there. I was just very calm because I figured, well, Don, this is it. If I open the parachute, I'm going to die. If I don't open the parachute, I'm going to die. All of a sudden, they made a recovery of sorts. They, they probably pulled out at about 300 feet maybe, and they went maybe 100 and some feet away from me and struck the ground. They were all killed. And I pulled the ripcord instantly, but I pulled it just as I hit the ground. So the pilot chute, there's a little pilot chute that opens and it pulls the main chute out. I never had a chance. And I talked to people in the airborne and they say that probably I was doing 150 miles an hour when I struck the ground. Now you figure that out. We were crossing, getting ready to cross the Danube from Hungary. And we were going to Vienna to bomb the oil refineries there, and, and they were another bad target. My pilot wouldn't understand that Goring had his, what we call the yellow nose, because the spinners on his, his fighter planes were painted yellow. And uh, my pilot pulled out of formation just before we got to the target, and that's the worst place to do it. But he wouldn't listen to me. And uh, we got hit by two fighters. I never saw them. The only way I knew we had trouble was when I got hit. And I heard all this banging, banging, because they carried uh, 
uh, 20, 20 millimeter cannons and their shells exploded not like our 50 calibers and that's what got me I had shrapnel all over this hand and as you can see the two holes where it got hit and the piece hit me in the back but I never felt that you know you watch a movie somebody gets shot and then they grab themselves and you know, all kinds of stuff I never felt anything I never felt being shot the only way I knew this hand was shot was I could see the glove was gone and two big holes and blood was pouring out of there like crazy and then when I got to the well the Hungarian police came and they arrested me I used to work with Hungarians on the farm and the only thing I learned was swear words and uh, but I could see my crew and it was a horrible sight they were all very recognizable they were nude their clothing when the plane hit, the top blew off, and the heat just disintegrated all their clothing. They had nothing on. They had no hair. They were looked like they had been roasted like a roast, a roast chicken, which is what they had been. And you could see each one where he was when the plane hit, and that they couldn't get up and get out. The, the ball turret fella was standing up in the ball turret. Well, of course, he fell over when he died. He couldn't climb out of the turret. And one fellow went to the tail to help the tail gunner, and he, both of them could not get forward. And I'll never forget that, not until I die, because it's a very vivid picture. I, I trained with those men for over a year. We were a family. So then the Hungarian police deployed my parachute and put it on the back seat because they could see I was bleeding back there, which I didn't even know I'd been hit back there. And they took me to the jail. And they got a doctor to come from town, I guess. And he was apparently out on a date with either his wife or a very, a very pretty Hungarian lady, whatever. And she came in. She sat and watched while he did what he could do for me. He kept apologizing. I could tell that by his expression, because I'm sure he thought he was hurting me. Because he, he, he was picking shrapnel out and he cut my rear end with a pair of scissors and then showed me a piece that was the biggest my thumb, all jagged, that had gone in my body and just stuck out. So he had a cut not so he could pull it out. And he kept apologizing, but he bandaged me all up and then they put me into jail cell. And the next morning, they gave me a guard, or they had a guard, that took me down to Budapest, where I was going to the hospital. And we rode on the train, and it was really, I like apartments, beautiful country. Nobody gave me any trouble. There weren't too many on the train anyway. And this one Hungarian was all dressed up in a suit, and he had like the old kind of attache case with the zipper. And he pulled out a loaf of bread and he pulled out a bottle of wine and that was, that was his lunch, he ate it. So I had no trouble on that trip going down. Nobody bothered me. And I just sat there and looked at the scenery. And uh, when we got to the railroad station in the middle of town, we got off the guard and I and they sat me right out in the middle of the waiting room. And I was a weird looking thing with this uh, blue long john suit on and a huge bandage on my hand. It was bright red because I was still bleeding. And uh, Hungarians began to gather around me and look at me and talk to each other and talk to the guard. And uh, one guy came up and spit on my face just spit right at me, right on my face. And the guard did nothing. He was not going in. They probably could have killed me because a lot of prisoners I know were killed that were shot down, particularly, I think it was Frankfurt. The Air Corps bombed Frankfurt totally to the ground. From what I hear, you could stand up and look and see the whole town. There was no buildings left at all because they hung so many American prisoners. And. Uh, Finally, the transportation came. They took me out of there, thank goodness, and they took me to a office building where there were 
Hungarian army officers. And some of them could speak English. And they were telling me that the war was practically over. The Germans had this, this flying rocket bomb and they're going to destroy England and whatever. And I, I thought, oh, you're full of it. Propaganda. Well, it was true. That was the V1. But from there, they took me to the hospital. And for some strange reason, they walked me right by a room where there were American prisoners. I could hear them talking. And I could see them, but we went by, didn't stop. And I wound up down in the basement in this huge, you have to call it a jail cell, but it was big enough that there was probably 40 or more other prisoners, but not American, Hungarians, Yugoslavs, maybe even some Russians. I imagine there were some Russians there. And I, I didn't know what I was doing there. They didn't know what I was doing there. But the minute they heard I was an American, man, they thought I was God. There was four sleeping in a bed, four under the bed on the floor sleeping, and they emptied the whole bed out just for me, and not even under the bed. <laughs> and uh, I was constipated, and that was kind of humorous. They were so concerned. There was a toilet sitting right in the middle of the room. You had no privacy, and they'd, they'd get me up take me over there and get me to sit down. And uh, they'd watch and I'd sit and sit and try to please them. Funny, I'd get up because I couldn't. Nine days in a row that went on. And when I did finally go, they all cheered and clapped. And it was, it was so exciting for them that I finally had a bowel movement. So I was there quite a while and then we got bombed out of it. Oh, and the guy came in to shave me. I don't know why they worried about that, but he had a straight razor. And he hated Americans, apparently, because he started shaving me and he'd be waving, waving his razor and like this. And they all gave him a very, very hard time because I was their friend. So the next time he came to shave me, he didn't have a razor. He had this stuff that ladies use today to take the hair off their faces or noses or whatever. And it was a paste, icky stuff. But he put it on and then when it dried, he took a, a tongue depressor. And he shaved me with that and my beard came off that way. But not once in the whole month and a half that I was in the hospital did a doctor ever come in to see me. Never was my bandage ever taken off. It was the original bandage the doctor put on. Same way for my back, nothing was ever done for me there. Finally, we were bombed out of the hospital, and that was a horror. Quite often at night, the British used to bomb, but they bomb at night, and they have planes called Pathfinders. They fly over the target, and they drop flares, and then the bombers come in and bomb the target. They bombed around us quite a bit, but never, never once did we feel threatened, because they, for some reason, our building was not going to get bombed. Well, finally, we heard this uh, Bud yeah, Budapest uh, active as something like that, but that means aircraft, or, I mean, warning. And then when they say Budapest, Vijas, I mean, the voice goes up, and that means the bombers are there. And we heard them coming. It was the 15th Air Force. I don't know how many planes, but we usually had about 700 some airplanes on a heavy raid and they bombed that hospital right to the ground. And the Americans, if they didn't get them out, I dove under the bed. In fact, we all dove under beds. It was the only protection we had. And shrapnel was coming in through the barred windows and the implosion from the bomb sucked the steel door that had rebar going into the walls, right out of the wall, into the room. It was. I have never, ever been as frightened as I was then. I couldn't even pray. I, I was just laid there waiting to die. Because you could hear this boom, 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 and then boom, walks away. Horrifying. Because you know, to, to drop in probably 500 pounders to do as much damage as they were doing, and you know you're going to die. <laughs> How can you not die? Well, once again, God was there, and none of us were killed in that in that room. 
So they, 200, 204 or 240, I forget what they told me, later on were killed over us. So I have to assume those Americans were killed. So once again, God put me where I should be. Nobody knows why I was there, but I know why I was there now. So they moved us to another hospital over on the Pesh side. It is Buddha and Pesh. It used to be two cities, and then it became one city. And it, it, it was actually the hospital we were in first was in, in an industrial area, which is why all the bombing. The second place we went was not. It was up the side of a mountain almost, and uh, where people lived. And while I was there, a guard came in and got me and took me down, walked me all the way down by the Danube to, to a, a large courthouse. And they tried me. They tried me for murder. The way I got the story, there was two Hungarians in that new hospital. Both of them spoke English. One of them was crazy as a loon. And the other was probably crazier than the moon even. But they both spoke very good English. And it was such a pleasure to hear somebody I could understand. And I was tried. No one spoke English. My lawyer didn't speak English. I'd never seen him before. I never saw him again. None of the judges spoke English. And the next thing I know, I marched out, back up. And on the way back, we passed a woman an old woman, and she burst into tears. And I thought, God, lady, you don't know how sorry I feel because I know what happened to her. Probably her family or her son or somebody was killed. And she knew I wasn't a Hungarian, not, not with that crazy blue Long John suit on. And I almost cried with her, but of course the guard just kept me moving. And uh, when I got back into the into the hospital room. Once again, it was a larger room, but instead of having single beds, they had built row beds where you lay side by side. And uh, that's when the two of the spoke English told me what, what had happened, that I had been tried for murder and convicted, and I was going to be shot tomorrow morning. And that night, well, that they learned when the guard came in that night, he yelled at me in Hungarian. And they said, sir, this one guy always called me sir. He said, uh, they're going to shoot you tomorrow morning because you were found guilty of killing all these Hungarian soldiers. They claim you stayed in the airplane and used your machine guns from the turret to shoot and kill these soldiers who were trying to help you. And if they'd seen the airplane, they would have known better. <laughs> no way I would have survived that. So I didn't sleep that night at all. But they were expecting to be called out any time and taken out and shot, but they never did. He said, I don't see any scars here anywhere, so I either or they missed, but they never did. So finally, they took me out of the hospital, still with the bandages on, and uh, took me down to, pen to penitentiary. And I was there overnight. And I heard this bombing, RAF. And the next morning, I was still in this, in a large room they put me in. They hadn't put me in the cell yet in the penitentiary. And uh, the door opened and they shoved these seven, I think it was, Polish pilots that were flying with the RAF or Polish air crews. And they had been shot down and captured. They're a crazy bunch. Minute they, they just shoved them in the door and, and locked it, they began banging on the door and kicking and screaming. So the guards come in to see what's going on. They wanted bread. So the guard called in a bunch of other guards and beat the living daylights out of those stupid Polish people. I mean, what's the point? They taught us before we went overseas to be a, a pain, f plug toy. That's why we never had flush toilets in the first place. We had big trenches with seats over them, and that's where we went when we got to prison camp, that is. And uh, they just beat the living heck out of them. And they took me away, because I stayed in the corner. I wanted nothing to do with those Polish fellows. 
and they put me in solitary and I was in solitary for I think it was two weeks but I'm not really sure it, and uh, all I had was a little window about so big to look up I could see the sky and it was very painful because I felt my family's under that same sky that I'm under and I can't talk to them I, I can't tell them all right I can't tell them I can't see them that's it while I was in there one day I heard a ruckus next door in the cell next to me and they don't have bar doors they have a little peephole where you see the guard move a slide and he looks in at you see what you're doing that's all you ever see is an eye well apparently this was a fighter pilot next door uh, I don't know what he was but he was an American and he must have poked that poor bugger the Hungarian bugger in the eye with his finger so he he went and got help and they dragged him out and beat the living the heck out of him I thought what did you gain by being mean, that stupid I'm not going to get myself beat up. It's not going to win the war. It's not going to make it any shorter or any longer. So I behaved myself. I didn't make any trouble. Finally, they called me out and the German officer sitting at a desk. He said, sit down. So I did. He was very nice to me, which I expect that because they also told us they'll, they'll be nice to you and make you think they're real great guys. He even gave me a cigarette. I used to smoke in those days when I had him and uh, he spouts off who, who my teacher was in third grade or some grade and he was right he even knew what toothpaste I used <laughs> I don't know how they found that out but they they collect stuff about you along the minute you join the army during World War II the Germans were they had Germans in this country a lot of them spies and they gathered all the information they could and they had that up in Frankfurt I think is where they had it and they would uh, send that down and the officers knew all about you your mother's name your father's name and the fact that my mother and father were divorced he knew all that and it's supposed to shock you on the blurting out all the military secrets here that you're hiding which of course I had I was only a a flight engineer gunner that's all I was I said to him I said sir the general doesn't talk to me never talked to me and anyway I've been missing an action for about three months because uh, of the fact that uh, the Red Cross didn't learn about me until I, be I became a German prisoner so all that time my folks had no word of whether I was alive or dead so he didn't beat me or nothing else and he got nothing out of me. I told him, you want to know what kind of bombs were carried? I said, I don't load the bombs. I have no idea. We just fly and we drop whatever's in, in the bomb bay. So it was easy. So he put me back in Frank, back in, in solitary. And I think it was about two days later, they took me out and they took me to a train station way out of town. This little rinky dinky place. And there was other Americans that they had gathered, and they were there. And then we waited for a train, and we, these Hungarians were coming home from work, apparently, and they walked by, and they all carry swords or knives or something. So this one guy comes over. We had German guards now, which made a difference, thank goodness. And he pulls the sword out, and he's waving it at us and yelling at us and, and waving that stupid sword. Funny, this German sergeant, takes his burp gun and says, Los! Los! <laughs> the Hungarian ran like a scared rabbit because he knew the German would shoot him probably. So we got loaded on a boxcar and it was so small that there were so many of us that we couldn't lay down. We couldn't hardly sit down. We mostly had a stand. We had a coffee can. That's our, our toilet, which we shared, passed around and dumped it out the window. And we got up to Vienna, and they stopped and let us out for some exercise. But it was a long train ride clear up into Poland. And that was our first introduction to our prison camp, where we were going to be. And they didn't have enough baggage. There was 10,000 10, prisoners, mostly British, because the British were in the war longer than we were. But 
they didn't mix us. They had compounds for Brits and the compounds for the Americans. And there was 10 compounds with 200 men in each compound. And all they had was tents. Well, they had barracks, but we, they had too many and the barracks were full, so they put us in tents. We have not much to do except sit around and talk or whatever. But we made a ball out of rags that we had from probably our, our clothing was getting pretty bad. They had a walking path around the compound, so we walked a lot too. And next to the walking path was a little, like, fence. And uh, that was 10 feet from the, from the barbed wire. One day our ball went over and we knew we couldn't go after but they had stooges, that's what we called them. They were the Americans, American Germans, that had been in this country and they went back to Germany for the war. And uh, which brings, brings me up to another funny thing. The stooges didn't carry weapons. They had on like a blue jumpsuit or something you might call it. So you knew they were stooges. And we spent a lot of time figuring out who could speak American and who couldn't. And when we found one that we felt, felt pretty confident couldn't speak American, we'd say, oh, you stupid S of a B, and then we'll smile all the whole time, and yeah, 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 yeah. They thought, they thought we were being friendly. We were calling them every bad thing, which I'm not repeating. <laughs> Once in a while you make a mistake, and then you better be fast of foot. <laughs> but anyway, when the ball went over the fence, we asked this German stooge, would you please get it for us? Figured they wouldn't shoot him. Wrong. He went over the fence, they shot him. They killed about, while we were there, probably six or seven of their own guards. One was opening our doors in the morning, and they figured he was trying to escape, so they shot him. One was working on a pole fixing wires, and they shot him off the pole. I don't know what they thought he was escaping to. And uh, it wasn't funny. I mean, not something you laugh out, but we knew if we, if we ever went out the window or something, <laughs> we were dead. And we had a guard called Big Stoop, because he reminded us of Big Stoop of Terry and the Pirates, which was in the comics before any of your times. A big fella. And uh, one day, while we were in the tent, we took the bottom of the tent out to shake it clean because it was full of dust and dirt from us. But we slept right on that. And uh, it, the wind blew the dust and dirt all over Big Stoop. And he pulled his Luger out and started shooting at us. He was a lousy shot, and we were very glad he was lousy. But he chased us. And we'd run around the barracks, and each time at least one or two would get in the barracks. And some of us went under the barracks. And finally he got tired of that and he went away. But uh, another funny thing about it is they count us every morning. They pull us out and they count us. And it was from each, each, each barracks. And there'd be two Germans behind, two Germans in front. And they'd go down and count, nine, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, all this. And then they checked the numbers at the end and they never could get them to match. So, but the short ones carried long rifles and the tall ones carried short rifles, so the top of the rifles were all pretty near the same. It's, it's just stupid stuff, but it gave us something to laugh at at least once in a while. One day an airplane, a German airplane, got shot down or crashed. I don't know how, why he crashed. And we cheered, and that was a bad mistake because they were Germans and it was a German pilot. And they opened fire on us that day, but they didn't hit anybody. They were angry at us. A lot went on in, in camp. We had two, a Catholic priest and a, uh, a Protestant a pastor. And we, we had a chess set. And we'd sit down and play chess, and they'd stand behind, and they'd play against each other using us to move them. And that was kind of fun. We had 80-seat outhouses, if you want to call them that, 
40 down each side, and it all dumped into a concrete tank. I was laying in the tent one morning when I heard a boom, and it sounded just like flak hitting the airplane. So I jumped up off the floor and ran outside to see what the noise was about. Boom! The tank exploded. And I mean, everybody within 100 feet of that tank got, you know what, all over them. And the German guard standing there with his hand on his rifle strap, and he says, Ach, Scheisen! <laughs> we all had a laugh, even though we were a mess, because we said we did it on our guard. We did it on the German, indirectly, but it was us. Except the Red Cross of America and the Red Cross of Canada didn't send packages. We would never have made it out of the camp. We didn't have much food. They had sauerkraut, and we called it brown murder. Everything was dehydrated. Germany planned for this war long before the war started. And the sauerkraut gave us all such gas that it wasn't very, very good. Then they had what we call ball bearing stew. It was like little peas or something, but they were rock hard. And even cooking them didn't help any. And uh, I don't remember much else, but the food was not good. Coffee was made out of burnt rye grain. After a while, you got used to it. I mean, you're hungry enough, it tastes good. But we were all losing weight while in the camp. We didn't really, I don't think, we didn't realize it quite so much because it wasn't that bad. We, uh, had dysentery terribly, and we had it on the walk, too, which didn't help us. And this German guard had it, and he came to us, and there was about three or four of us standing around talking. And he acted very friendly. He said uh, he gave us some, he gave us some brot, some bread, which we rarely got. But he wanted to know what we do for our dysentery. So we had lots of uh, these little red pills that were not dysentery. <laughs> they were the other way. We ground them up and put it in coffee. And we told him to drink the coffee. And of course, he got worse and worse and worse. And after a while, we didn't see him. So I don't know what happened to him. But drink more coffee. Drink more coffee. <laughs> and then they forced us, forced March. So now they had to move. 10,000 people, because the Russians were coming down and they were going to go around our area and catch all that in that area. And the Germans were definitely afraid of the Russians, because a lot of hate there. And because uh, they had invaded Russia and done a lot of bad stuff to the Russians. So they were in a hurry to get us out. And Hitler didn't want us left. I wish he had, because a lot more of us would have survived because of Russian. I don't think they would have shot us to death. Hitler did not want to lose any prisoners at that time. He eventually, he wanted us all shot to death. And uh, by then, the officers that were leading our mass of what was left of us knew better. They knew the war was near the end, and that they'd have to answer for that if they killed us. But Hitler wanted us killed. So he walked us, and we had nothing to take but one blanket and no spare shoes, no spare nothing. Just what clothes we had to begin with. And we slept in the snow for the, about the first week or more with one blanket out in the field. And they surround the field with guards. They had a lot of guards, but didn't have enough. We could have escaped. But where would you go? In the middle of winter, they track you anyway. We walked for three months. We we were forced march about 36 or more miles a day. We were not fed. We got fed some potatoes maybe every fourth day. That was it. One day we were walking down the road and the guy next to me spotted a carrot that a horse had gotten rid of. Picked it up, wiped it off, and ate it. And he was thrilled. And I was. I'm sorry, I didn't see it first. But uh, we all got so 
weak that some of the fellows couldn't walk and the Germans would shoot them. At first they started putting them in a wagon, taking them into town, some town nearby where they'd leave them, then they'd come back and they lost the wagon or something. We were strafed by the American pilots while we were on the road and the Germans said, don't run, stay together and they'll know you're prisoners. Well, we tried that and some of us didn't get up. Our own pilots. Now you'd think when they see a column as long as we were that they know damn well we weren't German soldiers. We weren't carrying any weapons. And uh, so after that we ran and we scattered and they still shot at us but they, we wanted at least a group. And uh, we crossed the Elbe River three times and the third time there was no bridges left. So they put us on a barge and they, they could get maybe 30 or 40 of us in this barge. Probably not that, not that many maybe. And at the same time, here was a oil barge coming down the river. And then these four British fighter planes flew over. And that poor captain of the barge didn't know what to do. He was steering this way, that way. If he had any brains, he'd have jumped off and swam to shore. But they, three of them stayed up probably 500 feet, and one came right down to the water and looked at us, and we all waved. And the Germans were shooting at him. He had a lot of guts, and they didn't hit him, luckily. And then they went up. We got off the barge. They sank the barge, and they sank the oil barge. The oil barge burned. Now, half of us was more. I don't know how many. Some of us were one side of the river, and it's a big river, and some were the other side, so we never saw them again. That's how our group gradually got smaller and smaller, where they could fit us in barns. And they put us in barns where they could lock us at night. But they, food we didn't get, water we didn't get. The only time we got water was when we went to a farm, and the trouble that was the water was bad because they build the barns up on the hill and the well down at the bottom of the hill. And so the water was bad for us and we all, some of us I'm sure died from dysentery. I was in a barn one night and I had a, it was so crowded and there was no place for me to lay near the door. So I had to walk stepping over people and I got way in the back and then I had dysentery and I, I got up and got towards the front and I saw the guard and I shook my fist at him. I yelled at him. I was, I was crying, angry crying. And you couldn't wash, you couldn't clean yourself. So you, that's the way you were until probably halfway through the march, we came to a place called Falling Boss and they had a prison camp there and they were dying at 11 a day there from starvation and dysentery. But they, they took us in the, stripped us, bathed us, well, we bathed ourselves. They gave us, because we had, I had scabies. I had lice, which we all did. And, uh, and all in your crotch and all lice and horrible. You, you just, you just totally miserable. And a priest was there and he gave us, he took a wafers and dipped it in wine, whatever. You know, we all had communion from him. And then he moved us right out because they didn't want to keep us here because of the death rate was so high there. But at least, at least we felt clean for a little while anyway. Couldn't shave. Well, we marched and marched and marched and one day we came to uh, what we decided was a, uh, oh, the, the German SS a training school for their kids. They took kids eight, nine years old and they taught them to hate their parents, taught them to be willing to kill their parents. And they were telling us, we could hear artillery in the back because we knew the war was coming coming down because we knew it wasn't German artillery. And they're trying to tell us, oh, that's our troops practicing because they spoke very good English. We said, oh yeah. The sad thing is we went to a town right after that and there was one of the kids in town and people were standing 
watching us go by, and we were a sorry-looking sight. We were filthy again. We were starved. We were gone, like you saw the picture in the book. And uh, this one German woman, old woman, stepped off the curb and handed one of the fellows a piece of bread. And this German kid pulled his dagger out and killed her right there. Wiped his knife on her dress and left her laying in the street. I cried then. I actually did. In fact, I, got, I could cry again now just thinking about it. It was horrible to see him do that. Kill this poor old soul that felt sorry for us. Anyway, finally we went, we went through one area where a lady came running out of our house. We, this, as I said, was getting, we knew near the point because we, we were getting artillery from both sides. The Russians were bombing. <laughs> the English, the English were uh, bombing the, I guess, the Russians. Not on purpose, but we could hear the shell fire go overhead. And uh, this lady ran out of her house and she handed me a piece of white bread, a whole, whole slice. And she was in tears. Not all Germans were bad. And I ate that piece of bread and I thought, my God, that tastes like cake. And she gave some of the other fellows some too. And we loved her for that. And it gave us a little more faith in, in the German people. And uh, it was shortly after that that they locked us in a barn, and, and that night the artillery sh fire was horrible over us. And we heard small arms fire, and we knew we were, we were at the front. What the Germans were trying to do was keep us from the front. But the front joined, so to speak. The next morning, the barn door opens, and this Englishman steps in the officer and says, Cheerio, chaps, you're free now. And the German guard threw his rifle down and says, I'm your prisoner now. You feed me. Because <laughs> they were hungry, too. And they started to march us out of there. There weren't too many of us left. I'm sure they split off many different places because I've read more than three or four books from people that, like I did, about their experience and it helped me believe that what I wrote was true. And uh, we, were, we were heading back to their camp or their base when some Brits came rushing out of the woods and said, turn around and go back. The SS troopers are up ahead of you. And the, and the German, or the, the British troops said, the hell with that, we're going to go get them. And they went and got them, they killed them. Shot and killed them, they came back without them. Didn't take them prisoner. So we got to their camp and they started to feed us. <laughs> we had a line. We were all starving. They didn't do us really any favors. They meant well, I'm sure. But our stomachs hadn't seen food, cheese, and all this stuff. And we all got so sick that it wasn't even funny. But we kept getting back in line, even or what have you. And that night I heard the radio and I heard Jack Benny, and I said, My God, I'm free. So they flew bombers in to a field near where we were and loaded us up and flew us out near the French coast to a place called Camp Lucky Strike. It wasn't really a camp, it was a runway and tents. And uh, the first thing that happened there was we began to complain about this hot chocolate, but it wasn't hot, it was cold chocolate. And they mix it in a large garbage can and they had a German doing KP and we couldn't figure out why it tasted so horrible. And we complained about it. And one of the fellows caught this German putting a gallon of gasoline and called us. And we all went in and we got him by his feet and hands. We had him upside down, ready, ready to shove him down into and drown him. And, and the MPs come in. I'm glad they did. And they stopped us. But uh, we never saw him again. They got them out of there. We all looked so horrible, they wouldn't send us home. And they wouldn't take us home until we gained enough weight to look decent. They hid that fact from the American people that we were all bag of bones. But one thing more that I forgot to tell you about that goes way back. 
when we were flying at our base, we, we didn't have any buildings, like an old barn maybe, and that's where we ate, and it was, it was a mess. And we all got together, raised enough money to hire some Italian craftsmen, and they built us a beautiful, uh, with tile flooring and all, place to eat. Mess hall, I was trying to think of the name. And uh, some of our fellows were pretty good artists, and they, they painted it all up beautiful. And one day I was going through the chow line, and it was hot and sweaty. Italy, in the summer, the dirt's that deep when you walk it billows around, at least wherever you are. And when it rains, you gain about four or five inches or six inches or whatever of mud, and you get taller. But I was in line, and I had my tray, and they had it at time putting the food on our trays. And he was handing out bread, and I got to him, and he reached inside his pants and scratched his privates, and then reaches down and grabs a piece of bread to hand to me. I dropped my plate or my tray right on the floor, ran out, back to my tent, and got my 45. I was going to kill him. And thank God, once again, they stopped me. But I, was, I would have killed that son of a gun because, I don't know, it just repulsed me to have him scratch his private areas, hot and sweaty, and then they had me bread to eat. So they, they all got control of me, took my gun away from me. And I never saw him again either. Every once in a while we'd hear explosions at a base not far from us. And uh, we found out later that the planes were exploding on takeoff. And the only way they found out who did it and that it was something being done was that one time the hand, this fellow was, was securing hang aids to the landing gear so that when they pulled the gear up, it pulled the pin and it would blow up and kill 10 men in, in the plane and wreck the airplane, of course. It came back and the, and the hand grenade didn't explode and they caught him. He killed 60, he downed six airplanes, so he killed 60 American crew members. And they caught him trying to get the grenade out before somebody saw it. And he was dead 20 minutes later. The CO held the court martial right there very quickly. There was no question. And he asked for volunteers and they shot him. He was being paid by the Germans so much on the airplane. They, they took us by trucks down to La Havre, and we got on a victory ship and uh, loaded us down in the hold. And it's just like a, a long set of stairs down in there, the only way out. And the bunks were 14 stacked high, you know, hammocks, whatever the heck they were. And I said, no. on the way out through the channel, we spotted a mine, and they shot at that mine, and they couldn't blow it up. Finally, they did. But I thought, geez, these guys can't even hit that mine in the water with all the gunnery they got there. They were, I think, Navy gunners. I just said I was not going to go down in that hole. So I stayed on deck the whole trip back. It took us 11 days because the boilers blew halfway across. The Brits had put new boilers in, but four of them blew. So our speed went quite down. And I slept on the deck. And the captain would come out and the officers would come out. Soldier, you should be down with the rest of them. And I kept telling them, sir, I am not gonna die down in your hold. Forget it, I'll stay up here. And I will knock it down there. And you can't force me, because I won't go. So they finally left me alone. I slept on the, right on the deck. And I go in to eat and to go to the bathroom, which was up at the same level as I was. And I stayed on deck the whole trip back. Luckily, it was summer. The ocean was smooth as silk. I could go up to the bow and watch the dolphins swimming out of the boat and see turtles go by and what have you. And as we got close to the coast, close to the coast, we saw this poor civilian out there fishing in a rowboat, and we tore that poor guy to death. 
we four referees. He could have been over a season already back for all we know, but we didn't care. He's the first one we saw sitting out there fishing while we've been over fighting a war. <laughs> and they put us in the fort down there, whatever fort it was, and we were all volunteered. They had German prisoners there that did the KP and all that. We all wanted to be guards. We wanted to kill them. And the thing that got us really angry, the Americans treated the German prisoners far better than Germany. Of course, Germany couldn't treat us well because they had no food. But uh, they ran out of coke at the base, and the first people to get coke were the German prisoners, and that really upset us. Finally, we didn't stay there long. They kind of gave it fresh outfits and what have you, made us look a little better, and helped us shave and all that. And uh, well, we went to the train station to get the train to wherever we were going. The loudspeakers going on, welcome home, boys, welcome home, boys. We bought bonds, we bought bonds, and, blah, and we all thought, yeah, and you made them a lot of money while we were over getting peanuts and getting ourselves killed. So we weren't too happy with that. But I got up to Newark, New Jersey, finally. What? I'm sorry, Fort Dix. Yeah, Fort Dix. And went through the discharge. They wanted me to re enlist. I would like to because I would have kept my rank since I had enlisted. My rank was permanent. And I had five stripes, so I was one more rank and I'd been at the top. But I had enough war. I didn't want to even think about it. And after they discharged us, I got up to Newark at the train terminal. I had a big money call home. I had nothing. They didn't give us any money when we got back. And uh, nobody was home, so I went to the bus. And the bus driver says, you're free, don't worry about it. Get in the bus. So I sat in the bus. And right in front of me were two women talking, just between me and the driver, which is the odd thing. And, and I heard this woman. And he heard her say to the, her friend, we wish this war would last longer because we're making so much money. And he slammed the brakes on in the bus, turned around and said, you get off my bus now. I don't want to even ever see you again. And he kicked both of them off the bus. And everybody in behind cheered and clapped their hands for him. But it shook me. He's lucky. She's lucky that he jumped before I did. Because that hurt to hear someone say that it's all we've been through to have somebody impressed with all the money your husband's making. I got home late after most people had already gotten home. So the, not that I expected a celebration, but the, somebody picked me up at the airport, for, or not the airport, but down to the train station. God, I guess they didn't know I was coming. And people wouldn't believe They'd ask me, how was it during the war? And the minute you started talking, they'd look at you like, boy, you're a lying son of a gun. You want pity, you want this and that. And to the point that all of us refused to wear our ruptured duck, which is what you got to show you were honored to be discharged because people in sales would take advantage, say, hey, here's an easy mark, you know, and people wouldn't believe what you told them. So for a long time, I couldn't talk about the war. And uh, my mother thought she knew all about handling and returning veterans. And I, I wasn't discharged yet, now that I think about it, because I had to go down to Newark, New Jersey, to the park. I didn't have enough points to get out. In fact, I was a POW, didn't mean a thing in points. They should have. They should have been glad to let me go home. So I had a, they, they put me in the court, in the, in the provost marshal's office. I had a lot of fun. I'd steal his jeep and go over to the airport. And one time we got all the shotguns and stuff we could get together. And we went over to the airport. They wanted us because they had so many wild dogs that the wild dogs were attacking the workers. And we rode around blasting dogs, <laughs> killing them. And the officer would want his jeep and I'd have it. And then I'd get hell when I got back. And one time in the office, the phone rang, and there was two offices actually, and but the one phone. And this 
boy says to me, because I was the only one there, he says, uh, is Major so-and-so there? I said, no, sir. He said, what about Captain so-and-so? I said, no, sir, he's not here. And he went through the whole roster. And then he says, who the hell is this? And I said, this is some dumb son of a bee that doesn't know any better. And then the whole time went out and never went back until I saw him. He came rushing over, but he didn't know who it was. But he could have been a little more courteous. Said, who the hell is this? It's been hard. It's been hard after the war because the VA hasn't been able to treat me. They don't know what to do. They even told me to my face one day, we don't know what to do for you. What do you want us to do for you? Well, help me. Well, we don't know how to help you. You know, most people come home that look bad, fine. I didn't look bad because they fed us up and I was rested. But upstairs here, I've had problems ever since the war. I've been suicidal since World War II, but I have never tried because I knew if I did, I would do it. Two of my best friends from prison camp killed themselves after the war. They couldn't tolerate it. What was happening that was driving me off the cliff was every morning I'd wake up between a, a wake and a sleep, I guess, and I relived being shot down day after day after day after day. And it, was, it was just more than I could handle. I'm still fighting over. I wanted to go to college. And uh, my head was so screwed up I couldn't handle it. But I did go back to school to get my mechanics license. I went to New York City. And so I've had four years of education in aircraft maintenance, which is very rare, not counting the Army time. But I haven't been a nice person, and I know it. That's why I wrote that book, so people hopefully would understand what I went through, because nobody wanted to believe it. As I said, God had a lot to do in my life, and a lot, particularly during the war. Things happened that should have killed me and didn't.